So let me introduce someone who needs no introduction. Chris Austin, director of NCADS. The godfather of comp. <laughs> it's all yours. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. And I, it was great to be asked by uh, Colin to do this. Um, you know, I, I've been at NIH for almost um, 16 years now, um, but I look back on comp as arguably the most important thing that I started um, since being here. And um, it was one of the, uh, it's a singular pleasure for me, not only scientifically, but, but community-wise. I, I don't think um, you may realize how special the mouse genetics community is. And uh, I know you, you have your fractiousness, and that came out in the original Banbury meeting. If you can imagine, you know, Alan Bradley and Brian Sembrovich and all these folks in the same room at the same time, you know. We, uh, but, but still, in the end, it comes together as it did in that meeting, and, and it allows you to do things which are quite remarkable. And I hope you value that. Um, it's not always the case in the human world, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, the human world, whether it's uh, we're talking about uh, human genetics or other kinds of human interaction. Um, and and I, I would just urge you when you, um, as you're thinking about the next stage, to be as, as bold as we were back then in 2003. And I, I just went back and looked at, the, uh, in, at, at this um, paper again and, and, uh, and, and looked at what we said in the, in the, the abstract. And it's, it's interesting to look at what Steve's slides are because uh, the community has done much of this. Uh, but, but it's hard to, it's easy to forget how, how uh, unorganized and inefficient this, this whole process was uh, back uh, 15 years ago. And in uh, this idea that uh, this last sentence is time to harness the new technologies and efficiencies of production to mount a high throughput international effort to produce and phenotype knockouts for all mouse genes and place these resources into the public domain. I mean, at the time, that was, uh, uh, that was um, uh, audacious to the point of, uh, of, of being foolhardy in some view. Um, but you've shown it not to be foolhardy and um, uh, have shown over and over again that if you get a lot of smart people in the room that are committed to a really ambitious, important vision, these things can happen. And, and um, I look forward to being involved in, in, in whatever way I can and encouraging the work that you do in the next phase. And, and I'm excited about the directions you're going. So what I decided I would do today, and, and um, Colin asked me to do, was just to give you some reflections on uh, some uh, things that are going on in the human world uh, and the human genetics world. I'm not going to go into any detail because you've got fantastic people who are going to talk to you about individual programs, but I'll just tell you sort of where, where I think in some ways we are. So th this is how uh, I often describe the problem that we're in. It's the problem that uh, brought me to uh, NIH back in 2002. Uh, but it's, it's, it's gotten uh, arguably even uh, more extreme since then, is that uh, we live in a, an almost uh, painfully uh, 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 bittersweet time where we know more about ourselves and health and disease than we ever have, perhaps exemplified by the Genome Project and embryonic or, or induced pluripotent stem cells, that's what you're seeing on the bottom left, or ability to make, um, uh, uh, to make uh, uh, mouse models of human genetic disease uh, in, in remarkably uh, rapid fashion and phenotype them. But, but if you ask, you know, how are people doing on the right side, this is a, 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 a report from the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, a few years ago called Shorter Lives, Poorer Health, sort of goes into depressing detail about the, the health of the American people or lack thereof. And uh, the bottom right is a child with progeria, is an early um, uh, aging uh, rare, rare disease. Uh, and, and so we are left with this really interesting question to the degree that what's on the right side is, is related to and built on what's on the left side. Why has the left side so outstripped what's on the right side? You know, those of you who are, uh, who are uh, um, clinicians, if, or you think about the last time you were at a doctor, for the most part, unless you're a cancer 
uh, doc or a cancer patient, uh, you know, your care has really not changed very much in the last 30 years. My own clinical specialty is in neurology, and if you think about neurological diseases, uh, the care of neurolog neurological and psychiatric diseases has really not changed very much in the last 30, 40, 50 years for the most part, despite these amazing uh, advances uh, in, in fundamental science. And, and so, the, so the question is, how, how do we do this better? And, 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 and believe it or not, I think what you're doing is absolutely key to this. So what do I mean by this? The, the, the reason I believe that this has remained such a problem is that science has never been brought to this process of translation. It's, it's a remarkably empirical process uh, which, uh, uh, which is, has uh, many, many steps, increasing degrees of freedom, and the likelihood of, of a many-step process with an increasing degrees of freedom of uh, getting successfully to the beginning of the end, if you have a trial and error approach, that aggregate success rate approaches zero, and that's exactly what you see. But the answer is not to buy more lottery tickets. The, fig the, 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 the answer to this is to understand what the underlying science is that allows us to go from what we see in these, uh, in these more reductionist models, whether they're a genome sequence or a, or a cell on the bottom left or a mouse, uh, to what's on the right side as a human. And, uh, and, and I must say that uh, for the most part, uh, though we're making some headway, uh, from a patient's point of view, uh, we got a long way to go. Uh, I did a calculation a few years ago just to give you a, an, an audacious goal or a, a, a big problem to think about. I did a calculation a few years ago at the current rate, how many years will it be before uh, every human disease, most of which are rare numerically, uh, have a treatment? And that answer is 2,000 years at the current rate, 2,000 years before every human disease is treatable. Uh, and, and if one looks at the, uh, uh, the, um, the cost function, uh, uh, the, probably the only thing increasing more rapidly than college tuition is drug prices. Uh, and, 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 and no one will be able to afford these drugs at the current rate either. And that fundamentally comes from this relentless empiricism as well. The only way we're going to make this process uh, more effective and efficient is if we change this from a, 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 a system of, of, of essentially playing the lottery uh, to engineering uh, uh, and, and that, that, that has rules that make this predictable. And, and, and that's really the challenge, I think, for the next decade or more. So the question is, how can company IPDC contribute to this? Now, this is a slide that that Dave's shown, Francis has shown, I'm sure you've seen, and I show this at all of my talks uh, to illustrate the fact that, you know, translation is not new. People have been trying to do this for thousands of years, but the opportunity is new. Uh, and the, the, the need is new. Uh, so when I graduated from, from medical school and I was a postdoc, this was in the mid-80s, actually before this, this, uh, this uh, graph starts. So these are the number of human conditions in OMIM uh, that have a molecular basis. Now, there are not all diseases, right? So the, the Duffy uh, blood group antigens are in OMIM as well. But, but just take these as a proxy for, for human diseases. Studying for the boards back in the mid-80s was really easy because there were only about 10 diseases, human diseases, the, the molecular basis of which was known. Now it's well over 6,000. I don't know how people study for these things. It makes it really easy for David to, to come up with questions for the boards. You know, he's just like, he's like Professor Snape there, you know, oh, let's ask him about Hollywood and Spots disease this year. Yeah, right, exactly. It requires a lot of rubber bands. You know. but, but from a patient's point of view, you know, th th this is where the action is. Uh, and, and still, uh, of all of those, the, the t cumulative number of indications that have any treatment, FDA-approved treatment, is about 500. Uh, of rare diseases, I'll, I'll get to this, but the number is actually still a bit squishy. Uh, but, uh, but it is known that about 300 have any treatment, and that leaves about 95% or more that have no treatment. Um, and and these, some of these you've, you've heard of, a lot of you haven't hunted disease, Alzheimer's, or, or um, ALS, uh, uh, many other diseases um, that fit into this category. And, um, and, and some would say, well, gosh, you know, we all know that it takes 15, 20 years uh, f uh, to have a therapy uh, after a gene is discovered, uh, sometimes much longer than that. Uh, I often remind people, and you will be glad to know, that in every talk I give, I ask people, what was the first disease, the molecular basis of which was, dis was, was identified? And I got to tell you, I would say 98% of the time, nobody has any idea, which is just terminally depressing. Uh, the answer is sickle cell, in case you're, 
I hope you all knew that. Uh, but, but, but the point being that this is 1947 and there's still not a drug directed to that molecular pathogenesis. Um, so just because you have a, a gene doesn't mean you're going to have a drug anytime soon, but, but it certainly helps. But the question is, how are we doing? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Well, during this, uh, so, so you say, well, gosh, maybe what we need to do is just wait 15, 20 years, and there will be a right-shifted increase in the number of therapies that come from these discoveries, right? So that, that, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, 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 model to have. Unfortunately, you would be wrong, and the reason is that during this period of time, uh, this has happened, so this is Moore's Law. For God's sake, if you don't know what Moore's Law is, don't tell anybody, uh, because that's even more embarrassing than not knowing about sickle cell. Um, uh, it, after this, you can go Google it, and Google, Moore's Law will allow you to Google it, uh, and, uh, it but, but this is uh, the increasing number of transistors that you can fit on a microprocessor this is, that's, that's revolutionized uh, what we do. Uh, in computing in our daily lives. But during the same period of time, a therapeutic development has done this. This is E. Room's law. This is Moore's law spelled backwards. If this is it's a real paper. If you haven't read it, please do. It is really depressing. So make sure you have some, some, uh, you know, uh, some Prozac on, on, uh, or scotch uh, on board before you read this. But, but what's remarkable about this is this, this is showing dramatically, monotonically negative productivity growth in developing therapeutics since 1950 such that the number of new drugs that have been produced per billion dollars spent by the entire biomedical research community has gone down by 50% every nine years since 1950. I just think about it, gone down by 50% every nine years. I think of what's happened since 1950, the invention of computers, recombinant DNA, knockout mice, uh, you know, CRISPR, gene therapy, uh, you know, a, a huge number of cloning. And none of this has had any effect on this decline in productivity. So the, this, this is depressing in a number of ways. Uh, first is that uh, if, you, if you draw out this line, if you, if you extrapolate from this line, it goes, uh, it goes essentially to zero in 2070. Now, it can't go to zero because it's a log plot, but it becomes asymptotic in 2070, which means that unless something changes, which has been the case since 1950, there will be no more drugs after, after 20. 70, or in other words, the cost will be infinity. So, so, so the other is that um, NCATS was, was formed in part six years ago to bend this curve. And, and we have to bend this curve in ways that are mentioned with computers and recon of DNA and all that have not. So we're, we need to take a fundamentally different approach to this. If I've given you two numbers so far, right? No drugs after 2070 if we keep going where we're going and 2,000 years before, even at the current, at the best rate, before every uh, uh, disease is, is treatable. So if anything tells you that this requires a think different kind of, 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 uh, of approach, the same way as COMP and IMPT, uh, IMPC has been doing for the last 15 years, you know, this is it. Uh, but, but this is in human genetics now. Um, okay. So, so into this maelstrom came NCATS, and NCATS in many ways is, is like, well, you know, look at the landscape, do for lots of other things uh, what you all have done for mouse genetics. Uh, and, and so some of the things that we're doing, I'm not going to go through all of them, of course, but, uh, but, but we spend a lot of time worrying about, worrying about the rare disease problem. And, uh, and David's going to talk about this. He's, he will give you a remarkable uh, uh, talk about this. Uh, but. Uh, th there is, an, but, but it is a connection, of course, between rare diseases and mouse genetics, but it's amazing how tenuous that is. Uh, 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 and, 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 and I believe, and, I'm, and I know Dave believes, that this, uh, this is a really opportu great opportunity for us. Uh, the first number <laughs> uh, you all can really help with. So um, we all throw around this number, about 7,000 diseases, maybe it's 6,000 diseases. That's the number in OrphanNet, uh, the number in GARD, which is the Genetic and Rare Disease uh, Database, but, and, and uh, approximately the number in OMIM. But that number is really squishy. When you, when you start to push it, it's really squishy. And, and so one of the things that, that we're really interested in doing is to, uh, is to do, um, uh, if I can use the analogy of a cot curve, those of you who remember what a cot curve is, you know, that, that's, it, that was what was done back in the old genome era. If you're trying to figure out how big the genome was that you were trying to analyze, uh, we have got to know that 
for rare disease. We got to know what the universe of rare diseases is and how do we define that. Uh, and it's, it's for, for those of you who are, or are clinicians, this is a big lump or splitter problem, if you know what I mean by that. Uh, but, but I think the mouse genetics community can really help us with this uh, because to the degree that uh, human and mouse genetics are cons and physiology are conserved, then uh, essential genes in one, with the exception that Colin was talking about, the human, you know, homozygous null people walking around, uh, you know, who knows? I sometimes wonder whether everybody in this room, you know, is, is homozygous null for something, uh, some essential gene, and that's why we're here, I don't know. Uh, but, 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 but the question, the question is how many genes in a species which we can prospectively mutate give us a phenotype. And it would stand to reason that that number ought to be about the same in, in mice and in humans with the exception perhaps of neuropsychiatric diseases or other, if there's other, if you believe in the concept of human specific diseases. Uh, but currently we think the number is about 7,000. Uh, they're thought to be about 80 percent Mendelian, uh, although that, as you know, that uh, is not quite as crisp a definition as we all thought it was in high school. Um, about 50, 60 percent have their onset in, in, uh, in children, so they're develop, either developmental uh, or, they're, uh, or they have their onset in, in, uh, in childhood, uh, that is before age 18. And something that Dave will talk about, which is truly frightening uh, from, from the perspective of developing treatments, is that, uh, uh, that if you look at this from a standpoint of, of syndromology, that means people identifying uh, new syndromes through, something like, through things like the uh, undiagnosed disease program or novel genotype phenotype correlations, there's about 250 new ones uh, generated every year. Um, and uh, give you a sense of this, the number of rare diseases which have a new therapy I, uh, uh, approved by the FDA for the first time uh, every year is around three or maybe four. So we're, so we're moving three or four from the untreatable to the treatable category every year and, and, and Dave is discovering 250 new ones every year. So either we got to speed up drug development for rare diseases or we got to, we got to defund Dave Valley. Now, I, you know, so I'm agnostic as to which, uh, which, which is the better option, but, but we, in Washington, believe it or not, that passes for logic, what I just said, <laughs> which is truly frightening. Okay, so uh, something that I think this community really needs to inculcate and something that we are really trying to change in the rare disease community is the word rare. The word rare is a real problem. Because as soon as you say rare, most people tune out. Um, uh, wh wh whether it's you know person in the in the in the uh, you know in your neighborhood or a congressperson or whatever, but but if you look at the over, the cumulative prevalence, 7,000 diseases times relatively low prevalence. Official definition is 200,000 or below, but most are in the few thousand range. The the population president prevalence is thought to be about eight percent, which is about the same prevalence of type two diabetes, and and these patients uh, account for a disproportionate, very disproportionate amount of healthcare spending, uh, 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 not even including the, the, the diagnostic odyssey. Uh, we do have problems in the, in the uh, human community. I know it will shock you that people don't even all agree from country to country on what a rare disease is, how they, def how they define it, so we got that problem. But the important thing is that it is clear that less than 5% five, five of them have any regulatorily approved treatment, uh, and I talked about the number of years. So, so. Um, Brendan Lee may talk about this later. I don't know. He's he's one of the uh, one of the um, uh, uh, PIs, uh, uh, a PI of one of these uh, uh, networks. This is something that Melissa Parisi is very involved in as well. Um, uh, it, this is uh, one of our approaches to the rare disease problem, uh, and the the idea about this is to uh, to change the way we approach rare diseases from a uh, each disease is independent of each other, and these are seven thousand independent uh, uh, um, uh, syndromes which have nothing to do with each other biologically, which is of course absurd, but that's, that's the way, it, 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 take the extreme phenotype, that's the way this has been addressed, to say, well gosh, these are all related to each other. They're all, this is 7,000, uh, this, is, this is a very large jigsaw puzzle with 7,000 pieces. They're all one color, so there's no pattern that we can see, but we got to approach this as a unitary 
uh, a problem and look for and look for commonalities very uh, prospectively. And so uh, these uh, this network uh, is funded uh, based on some kind of commonality that the PI will identify. It could be a, a all diseases of a biochemical pathway or an organelle or a cell type or an organ type or some sort of uh, a phenotype that the humans have, uh, but, but they group them, uh, three to 40 diseases, uh, studying them together uh, in, in some sort of uh, 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 common uh, biological uh, um, uh, um, fun, um, uh, feature. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is a, a, a natural place uh, for you all to interact uh, with, and, and I, I think Brendan, I hope Brendan will talk something about this when, when he talks later. The other thing which I, I just want to emphasize here, uh, which is really important for you all, which you've learned uh, from, the, uh, from the work that you've done so far, is, is, is this. That is that, that um, NCATS is to rare diseases as NICHD is to pediatrics. That is that everybody thinks of NICHD as the place that does all the pediatrics. And it does a, a plurality of the, uh, of the pediatric work that uh, NIH does, that it does more than uh, any other institute as far as I'm aware. I don't know, is that true, Melissa? I think, yeah. But, 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 but most institutes do work which is uh, relevant to child health and human development. Um, and, uh, and rare disease is the same way, um, of course. And so the, the RDCRN is run as a big, a consortium of, uh, of, of over 10 uh, ICs that just happens to be coordinated by us. Uh, the other thing we have, which I hope you'll take advantage of, uh, is something called the Rare Disease, uh, the trans NIH Rare Disease Working Group, um, which has, uh, I don't know what this is, eight plus uh, nine, 17 ICs uh, on it. This, this is, these are your people. <laughs> you know, you should think about these people as the, they, these people think about uh, problems from a human genetic and phenotype point of view in many of the same ways that, uh, that you think about uh, um, uh, mouse genetics and phenotypes. And, and so I hope as you go forward, you will use this group, and, and the, the, we're the coordinator, as you can see with the little, uh, the little uh, hashtag there, um, uh, and uh, Ann Pariser, uh, who's our head of Office of Rare Diseases, um, uh, is our point person on this. But, uh, but I hope you'll use this group uh, uh, as a contact. The, the, the asterisks are, are, are members of something called ERDRC. So, uh, so what is, what is ERDRC? Um, uh, I, I, think, I think there's some, um, I, I must have some uh, uh, response element which, which, which makes me uh, particularly attracted to large international consortia. <laughs> uh, um, uh, maybe it's because my mother kept telling me that many hands make light work and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, it, it actually happens to be true, uh, as you've as you've demonstrated. So, uh, about three years ago, I took on the uh, chair of this group, uh, which is uh, uh, just what it sounds like. It's a group of uh, 60 organizations uh, all over the world, uh, coordinating their work on rare diseases to try to make headway faster. It is in no way as cohesive and organized as, as uh, COMP and IMPD, IMPC are, um, um, but, uh, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, so it's, uh, it's about 40 funders, uh, all the biggest uh, 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 government funders and a number of nonprofit funders like Telethon, uh, about 15 companies or 20 companies, mainly small but also some large companies, um, about 15 patient organizations, and this is something that, uh, again, you should really think about taking advantage of. Most, most mouse phenotypes don't have mouse patient organizations, and uh, that's, this is an advantage of the human world, is that you, you do have uh, parents or patients that you can talk to, um, uh, and, and of course a number of scientific uh, programs as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I, and I, want, I want to just read you the goals because these will sound as absurd as the comp goal was 15 years ago, and that's on purpose. So the first one, um, uh, uh, it, well, so first of all, I need to tell you that, uh, that the, the current uh, 
standard, state of the art, if you can call it that, is uh, the average child of a rare disease, if child with a rare disease, and maybe mainly their children, but person with a rare disease, uh, will undergo a uh, di so-called diagnostic odyssey, wander from uh, doctor to doctor to doctor for five to eight years before they have a diagnosis and end up with a medical chart about yay big. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and all during this time, their quality of life and quantity of life is going down, and their, uh, their, their costs, their spending is going up, right? So, and, and, these, and so we asked ourselves, well, gosh, if all of these really have been defined in the medical literature before, why does it take eight years for this to happen? This is not a science problem, it's an operational problem. So we set this goal at the head of ourselves for the next, in the next 10 years, that all patients, come, all people, with a rare, suspected rare disease coming to medical attention, we'll get a diagnosis within a year. And that's, that's about a, a log faster than it currently happens. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of issues, organizational issues, among other things, uh, associated with this, getting people to work together, et cetera, uh, very much the kind of things that you dealt with um, uh, already. And that the, 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 the patients who were undiagnosable uh, uh, and, and there's, after you, if you ask, well, how many people are there uh, that if you, once you go through all the specialists and then you do exomes and then you do whole genomes, how many people remain undiagnosed? That number is around 30 percent, 40 percent, depending on who you ask. Um, so there's still many patients who are undiagnosed, uh, but, but, and so what we're doing now is to put these in proactively into a globally coordinated diagnostic pipeline. Um, so that within a year, within, within 10 years, we'll go from, uh, you know, 8 to 10 years for diagnosis to 1. I actually think that we could do this a lot faster than that, but, but I couldn't get anybody to, I couldn't get them to go, <laughs> go for a goal faster than a year. The, the second is 1,000 new therapies for rare diseases, um, uh, which is going to require a lot deeper understanding of pathophysiology of most of these diseases. Uh, and then a third one, which is, is uh, important but less relevant for this group probably, is uh, it, it, it was important for us to articulate that just because we make diagnoses available or make diagnoses and have therapies that are developed, if the patients don't get them, uh, uh, they're not going to help them. And, and it's not... We, we can't assume that anybody is going to benefit from having a diagnosis or a treatment unless we measure it. And so how do you measure that? And that's, that's really goal three. Um, and so there are a bunch of papers, of course, that we wrote about this. This is my co-chair, Hugh Dawkins, who's in Australia, uh, looking at the first uh, seven years of Erdrich and now the next 10 years um, uh, as, as well. Uh, and this has a number of people that you'll recognize, people like Kim Boycott and uh, Gareth Bainham and uh, Hans Locke Mueller and Petra Kaufman, a number of other folks that you'll, you'll recognize. Uh, the, the task forces, um, uh, um, I'll just tell you about to give you a sense of the kind of thing we're doing. A lot of these you'll recognize, matchmaker exchange, uh, uh, the automatable access and discovery, uh, being able to uh, 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 link records, uh, model consent clauses. These are all uh, coordinated with GA4GH. Uh, this, uh, this solving the unsolved is what I mentioned before. Uh, you know, if you reach the end of the road with current technologies, what do you do? You know, do you look at proteomics? Do you look at metabolism? What do you do uh, to try to figure out what's the wrong, what's 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 going on with these with these patients? Um, uh, so the the human genotype phenotype problem <laughs> um, is a, a rather silly title, but I, I, I use it to. Uh, illustrate two things which are going on. One is, and in case you missed it, last week the All of Us program uh, released uh, their, um, uh, or announced their awards to three genome centers. Uh, there are three of the usual suspects. They're University of Washington, Broad, and Baylor um, uh, to do sequencing for uh, the All of Us program. The All of Us program, of course, is the, the uh, hope for million cohort of uh, Americans who are uh, getting themselves uh, at least lightly phenotyped uh, and uh, uh, some level of genome analysis uh, yet to be determined. Um, but hopefully some sort of sequencing. Uh, and, and so that is going to provide a, another resource that, uh, that this group needs to be aware of. The, the other is this really uh, interesting discussion going on in the human world, which is very, very much like the discussion that we had at Banbury 50, 16 years ago, 15 years ago, and I'm sure you've had here, uh, which is, uh, is it practical and if so, how would you do it to phenotype uh, uh, humans with a variety of 
genetic or maybe non-genetic uh, uh, abnormalities. Um, and uh, Garrett Fitzgerald at Penn is one of the people leading this, but you'll recognize some of these people, Rory Collins, um, David Botstein, Rob Califf. Um, and, and so I frequently say to this group, have you talked to the mouse people? It, because they've been doing systematic genotype or phenotyping for 15 years. And, and, and the, usually the reaction is, why would I talk to a mouse person? <laughs> what can they tell me? And, and <laughs> so, you know, if I, I feel, you feel my pain and vice versa, I'm sure. But, but the point is uh, that, uh, uh, that you notice this, this, uh, this little quote here, deep phenotyping comes close to a human gene knockout study. Uh, and, uh, and so these folks want to do what you have already done. Uh, this is an enormous need in, uh, in human disease for a very simple reason. Unlike mice, humans go to a specific specialist to phenotype an organ, right? So mice don't do that. But if you go to a cardiologist and you have something wrong with your brain or your eye or your kidney, unless it comes up in a buon and creatinine, they will never know because, because it's, it, they'll never look. It's just the nature of our healthcare system, for the most part. Kids are a little different, because kids have generalists, right? They have pediatricians, but, but older, older adults do not. And so it's, it's a, and, and the other problem that you run into is that insurance will only pay for minimum phenotyping, tier one phenotyping, right? And, unless, for the most part, uh, a, a, unless it's absolutely required. So, it's, so there are all kinds of dynamics here, um, which, are, which are a little different. But I'm not sure how different they are. I mean, if you think about, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three, however you talk about phenotyping in mice now, uh, that it's a cost issue, just like it is in humans. So, so all the things that you've learned, I think, would be tremendously valuable uh, for human, the human rare disease and human phenotyping world uh, to move forward. The somatic cell gene editing program uh, that you're going to hear about from, uh, from uh, Mary Perry, who's the Common Fund person. Uh, it, who's, uh, who's in charge of this, uh, P.J. Brooks, who some of you probably know, who's in the Office of Rare Diseases, is the program coordinator. I'm the IC director who's responsible for this. Uh, and, and the idea is, the goal, as you can imagine, uh, is to get more treatments uh, out there based on gene editing. But, uh, but what, what are the needs that are being addressed? So this comes from a workshop. You know, NIH always has workshops about this thing. And, and what, the workshop, what the workshop identified was uh, uh, development of error-free editing uh, machinery, um, uh, including including the um, uh, non-cutting base editors. If you're not up on, on David Liu's work um, recently, please do. It's really rather remarkable, uh, looking at transmissions and transversions um, without cutting. Standardized assays for looking at genetic uh, uh, off-target effects, and this, again, things that you know a lot about. Um, uh, a, a bugaboo, which you may have done work in, I'm not sure, is, is this problem that's gone back all the way back to antisense. That is, if you, have a, if you have a nucleic acid construct, how do you get it to the tissue of the cell of interest? Uh, uh, how do you target it there? Uh, and that continues to be a problem. This one, relevant, oh, this says human and animal models. That, that should say pr non-human primate, uh, large animal and small animal models for preclinical testing. Um, there's there's a, a bunch of RFAs that are out to do this as well. And then, uh, interestingly, uh, a, a ways to, to track these modified cells long term. FDA is very concerned that uh, that these uh, genetically modified cells, which if they're if unless they undergo a turnover, are going to live in the organism, live in the human forever, and and they might go places in the body where you don't want them and do things that you don't want them. So how do you follow them? How do you mark them? How do you image them uh, over a very long period of time? So so there are a bunch of programs. These I took out the RFA numbers because they're not open anymore. They're all closed. But uh, but these are all programs that have funded grants that are uh, just coming out uh, now uh, to, um, uh, uh, to address these. Uh, and and the, the ones that you want to interact with, it certainly uh, are, are, of course, the small animal models, um, uh, uh, grantees, maybe some of those in, in this room, I'm not sure, uh, and then the uh, unattended biological effects and, uh, and the genome engineering toolkit, uh, highly relevant to what you do. Uh, something which has been an issue over and over and over again and, and has come up again um, uh, internally at NIH. I just want to mention to you briefly because it, 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 um, it does influence w the, the view of what you all do, rightly or wrongly. Uh, root reproducibility issues in uh, research with animals and animal models. 
the very fact that there is a National Academy of Medicine report on this uh, ought to give you pause. Um, and, and I realize this group is about as OCD when it comes to doing a wor obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, when, when it comes to doing good science as I know of, but not everybody is. Uh, and so uh, you, one of the things that I think you could get a appropriately a lot of mile uh, benefit from is to demonstrate how to do this right. I, and, and, and provide some gui provide guidance to the field about how to do this right. Um, and, and if you haven't read this, this is a paper that uh, I was on, but lots of people from NIH were on, uh, and uh, about transparent reporting to optimize the predictive value of preclinical research. What, what preclinical in this case means is animal models. That's what it means. Um, and uh, all kinds of issues of, of blinding and power calculations and uh, 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 all kinds of things. But it's, it's worth looking at this uh, because it's an issue uh, which has uh, come up again. We're going to be talking about this, and I've been pulled into this um, at the uh, annual uh, uh, NIHIC director's retreat uh, happening next month. Um, so this is certainly on the minds of many people here. Um, I'm just going to run through this. I'm not going to show you this. What, what I want to uh, just finish with is, uh, um, is, is another thing I'd like you to think about. So uh, one of the many reasons that therapeutic development fails in this, this region for this downward slope is that, uh, that even when a drug gets into people, into a so-called phase one trial, it still has an 80 to 90 percent likelihood of never being approved. That is, and it fails in humans. Things that look safe in animals are not safe in people. Things, that, drugs that looked uh, efficacious in animals are not efficacious in humans. Uh, and, uh, and that's the case 80 to 90 percent of the time. Um, uh, so uh, big problem. Um, lots of reasons for this, but a big problem that we spend a lot of time working on. Uh, and, and among the approaches that we're taking, and I realize this may be a little well, maybe, I don't know whether it's, whether it's out of scope for you all or not, but I, I just wanted to uh, have it in your head that w what we and many others are doing is to try to ask, well, how would we identify uh, 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 potential drugs better using more physiological systems short of a mouse? Because uh, normally what we do is we do a screen down here in some very high throughput setting, and then, then we generally go right to a mouse. And, and, and that, the, the lack of any kind of intermediary uh, of testing system, uh, whether it's a spheroid or an organoid or printed tissues or organ on a chip, uh, ha has really created a problem. You know, eventually, perhaps, we'll be able to go right from an organ on a chip to a human. Uh, we're not there yet. But, but the, the, the thing I'd like to suggest is that you might think about doing this in mice. And, and, uh, and, and I'll try to make clear why, why I think you should think about doing that. Um, uh, but, but this is the way to think about it. As you go from left to right, uh, you, you uh, go from a very high throughput compatibility in a 1536 well plate uh, down to a couple of compounds a day. These human on a chip uh, models have the same throughput as a mouse model currently. Um, so, um, and their cost is about the same as a mouse uh, currently. That may come down over time, um, but, but that's the current rate. Uh, and so, uh, one of the things we're doing uh, is to, um, is to bioprint tissues. This is possible given 3D printing technology and IPS and primary cell technology. Uh, we're starting out with uh, laminar tissues, retina, blood vessel, and skin, uh, but, uh, but a lot of interest in lots of other uh, organs, the idea being that these, you would then use these to screen for potential compounds, uh, which, uh, which might be drugs. Uh, the tissue chip for drug screening program is even a more extreme phenotype where the idea here was could we uh, create um, a, a system, uh, a microfluidic system which represents the structural and functional elements of all human tissues as a way to test for safety and efficacy of novel therapeutics. Uh, using the convergence, uh, to use a, co a, key, a key word these days, convergence of microfluidic cell, stem cell technology, 3D printing, uh, cell sensor technology, optogenetics, those kinds of things. Uh, and we started out with 10 tissues. Uh, these had to be uh, um, in a modular sort of uh, modular platform that you could mix and match these tissues, and they had to be alive without antibiotics for at least a month. Um, and uh, when we started this uh, seven years ago, uh, again, it was 
A pipe dream, I, I got to tell you, this has gone just like this project has, much faster than I ever thought it would for all the same reasons. It's a group of, uh, it's a diverse group of people with different expertise all coming together working to common goals, and that's why it worked. Uh, but if you think about what these kinds of so-called microphysiological systems can do, uh, they do all the things that a 2D system can't do, and as somebody who spent a lot of his career doing 2D systems, it gives me pause. But, but, um, but re uh, reconstitution of the, the, the uh, uh, microarchitecture of the organ, tissue-tissue uh, interfaces, flow control, um, oxygenation, mechanical cues, like stretch in the, in the lung, uh, spatiotemporal gradients. Just to give you an example, it is very clear that, that most cells do not go terminal differentiation until you put them next to cells that they normally are next to in vivo, and if, if relevant, you stretch them. Uh, say in a in a in a in a bowel, in a in a gut model or in a in a in a in a lung model. If you don't stretch them uh, in and out uh, the way you, hopefully all of you are doing now, breathing, um, uh, the cells do not differentiate. And you know teleologically, you think, well, why would you differentiate? The person's dead. If they're not breathing, they're dead. Why do you care if the cells are <laughs> differentiated? Uh, and 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 so we see dramatic differences in this, these kinds of models versus 2D models. Um, so uh, if you're interested in, in um, uh, just two points about this. One, this was done as a massive collaboration, still is, between uh, ourselves, a number of other NIH institutes, a large number of, of pharmaceutical companies, DARPA and the FDA. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, this uh, individual here whose name is Chip, Sorry about that. Uh, we couldn't resist calling him Chip, or her Chip, because it's really both. Uh, you can click on any of Chip's organs here and see the uh, state of the art of these uh, individual chips. Uh, but the other thing we've done, to bring it back to rare diseases, is to realize that these uh, microphysiological systems might be very good for uh, modeling rare diseases or even common diseases. So we now have, uh, in the next phase of the program, uh, 12 grants uh, funding a modeling of all these disorders. And if you look at the, in red, uh, is either the organ or the organ system uh, or the disease that's being modeled. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, tremendous progress just since 2012 when we started this. Okay, so some ideas, and I've thrown a lot of these at you already, and, and, and I, you know, per Collins' instructions, I've, I've um, I tried to be, you know, provocative or, or uh, uh, you know, set, set ambitious goals or audacious goals. Um, certainly what you've already, uh, what you've already set on doing, but something which would be amazingly useful uh, is to have knockout mice for all disease, all genes which are designated as rare disease genes. Um, uh, many of these uh, uh, have uh, even the same gene uh, 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 has tremendous mutation or allelic uh, heterogeneity in uh, uh, in the phenotypes that they that they produce. Lamin A is my favorite. Um, uh, three different mutations in the same gene give three completely different phenotypes. Um, we don't understand at all why that happens. Um, as I'm sure um, you'll hear about later, knockout mo models from the undiagnosed disease program, uh, allelic series for understanding more common diseases like all of us in top med, uh, mouse models for uh, gene editing effects, both good and bad. We're already starting to do that, as I mentioned. Something that you, you could think about um, uh, is, uh, is mouse versus human 3D tissues. The reason is when we go to FDA, and we say, we think this is a better way of modeling disease. They say, well, the gold standard is the mouse. Show me it's as good as the mouse. And we say, well, um, the whole reason we're doing this is that, 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 that animal models are not necessarily predictive. But they say, well, but the gold standard is the animal model. And that's the way regulators think. So give me a tissue chip in a mouse including a knockout mouse of the disease that you're trying to treat or, or, or an, an allele that represents a rare disease. And, and then I can compare uh, in vivo to in vitro within a species instead of going in vivo, in vitro among species because you're changing two things at once and you can't figure out what, if there's a discordance, why. Uh, this is something I've tried to get the tissue chip consortium interested in, but I get the same answer. Why would we do mice? Are you nuts? The whole reason is that we're, we're trying to get out of doing animals, even when the, even when the regulators say, no, 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 you can't, the kinds of mechanistic studies that you can do in a mouse, you can't do in a human. Uh, the, the, I've been singularly unable, uh, despite uh, pounding uh, the podium, uh, to, to get the human 
uh, 3D or tissue chip people to work on, on, on mice. And I just think they just don't understand the field very well, uh, but, but you do. Uh, providing guidance, as I mentioned, on the ongoing rigor and reproducibility of animal model research discussions. Uh, I think you could play a big role in that. Um, and providing guidance also on these human uh, deep phenotyping discussions. You know, we are really good at humans in, in, in genotyping humans now, right? I mean, you can do it, um, you know, well, you know this. Uh, you know, how long does it take to do an exome or a whole genome sequence? But, uh, but, but the phenotype side of the genotype phenotype has really lagged. Um, and, and the methods to do it have really lagged, and I think you have a lot to teach on that as well. So I hope I've given you some ideas to think about. Uh, I ironically have to go and do, in an hour, I have to go and do a teleconference on Erdurk, uh, uh, but then I'm going to be back in the afternoon, uh, and I'm uh, look forward to the discussion in the afternoon, so it would be good to be back. Thank you.